I think it's about time. Well, welcome everyone to the first episode of the Let's Talk Privacy and Technology series where we will be featuring experts, privacy experts and practitioners in the intersection of privacy and technology. We'll talk about things like privacy engineering, privacy enhancing technologies or PETs, data ownership, data ethics, privacy tech, cybersecurity, and more. I'm Lourdes Terecha, your host. I'm the privacy tech law and law fellow at Santa Clara Law, and I'm also an adjunct professor there. In my previous lives, I've been a privacy and cybersecurity lawyer in big law in a Fortune 300 company, and most recently in a cybersecurity leader in the, in the cybersecurity industry. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is Richard Vibert, and he is the CEO of, and co-founder of the privacy tech startup, Metomic. He's going to share with us his perspective on building a privacy first startup and his journey in the intersection of privacy and technology. Um, we'll also go into a discussion on cookies towards the end of our, of our episode. So hello, Rich, and welcome to the Let's Talk Privacy and Technology series. Hey, it's great to be here. Um, so it seems like it, it's been decades since we last talked to each other uh, in a coffee shop a few months ago in London. Um, and, and I don't think we actually got into how you, you ended up in the intersection of privacy and technology. So why don't we start there? Why don't you share with our audience how you got into privacy and technology yeah for sure so um yeah so like i've been i've been around technology for probably the last uh eight years or so so i started off my career as a data scientist uh in in a startup that was actually based out of new york um we were sort of we were, we were very much involved in the credit scoring space so we we're doing a lot of stuff with like alternative data this is the time when social media was still um, you know, it's still booming today, but at the time there was a lot of sort of innovation going on regarding credit scoring and how it sort of interacts with alternative data sources. And, um, you know, it was, it was around the time that people were starting to talk about data as the new oil and, you know, how business models were relying on data and this sort of thing. So it was really then when I came across, um, it wasn't so much privacy that sort of, um, you know, got me really interested in this. It was seeing the deep, dark web and what is the amount of data that's on there, right? You enter in your uh, email address and if you look in the right places uh, and you buy the right data sets you could see uh, stuff that I never knew sort of existed about me online existed about other people online um, and just like these just uploading like a single data point the amount that could be inferred from that from my previous browsing data and stuff I'd uh, uh, uploaded in the past uh, was kind of scary so that was sort of the first time that my eyes really opened up to this uh, you know concept of, of privacy and how uh, which way the sort of internet was trending in that in that area. So um, since then, I've always been like really passionate about um, what the uh, how you know the internet should look, um, how maybe it's trending in the wrong direction. And when GDPR came along, uh, and GDPR started to be discussed, uh, you know, certainly certainly went live a couple of years ago. Uh, it was really a chance to see what the world could become. So if you read the GDPR. Um, if you think about it deeply, it sort of talks about an internet that doesn't exist today, right? If every company followed it uh, really you know, uh, to the book, let's say, uh, the internet and online companies would be very much like a different space. So I've been interested in it for many years. I think over the last couple of years, it's really accelerated. Um, I've seen you know, sort of developments up leading up to GDPR and then since then, uh, what it's become from then. So uh, yeah, it's been, it's been an exciting journey. Uh, I've always been interested in it, and I think we're, you know, I think everyone here would agree it's uh, it's more exciting than it's ever been. Yeah, absolutely. I, I smiled when you mentioned if you've read GDPR because I'm seeing some names uh, from our list of attendees, and I know that leading up to GDPR, we we poured over, um, I think, all 267 pages <laughs> of that law, the text of that law. I'm just recognizing some names um, in our attendees here. Uh, so is that how, to talk to us about how you ended up, you and your co-founders ended up uh, starting Metomic. And, and was this when, this was after the startup, the New, the New York startup, correct? Um, and what, this was leading up to GDPR as well. Uh, talk to us about how that came about. Yeah, sure. So um, I dot around startups for a while, um, both in a data science role and then went on to some, some other positions at other companies. Um, my most recent role before I started Matomic uh, two years ago was 
I was at Sotheby's, the auction house, which was then a public company. It's now private, um, mostly an offline business. So most of the revenue was from, um, you know, auction houses. Um, but at the time they were sort of going through, you know, this transition to the online world, you know, putting more of their sales online. And whilst I was at Sotheby's, I was, I was head of data strategy, which um, was hugely exciting in some respects in the sense that they'd collected data over, you know, decades, both, both offline and also online regarding their users and how people buy stuff. Um, and sort of the chance to analyze that was, you know, super interesting. But at the same time, you know, it was the time when, when GDPR was coming about. And so you couldn't uh, do stuff with data in the same way that you used to, or at least, uh, you know, it sort of was, it was frowned upon a lot more. So a lot of my role involved uh, initiatives regarding GDPR. Um, and it was generally just the trends that I sort of noticed, right? I mean, at the time you had this incredibly um, jarring, let's say, law that came about that really questioned not just like a particular part of your business, but everything from sort of the, the um, technology through to the operations, even through to like the culture um, and how you sort of think about almost everything. So with that in mind and, and you know, the sense that the way that I saw companies approaching it, um, not just, you know, Sotheby's, but also other companies that, uh, you know, I spoke to and collaborated with, I didn't really feel that it was probably going to be the future of privacy. I didn't think, um, you know, whatever, however companies are approaching it, some hiring consultants, hiring lawyers, employing, you know, an internal um, privacy team, let's say, there wasn't really clear evidence that uh, I, I don't think it was going to sort of meet the standards that are required, both from a regulation point of view, but also from the general groundswell that consumers are starting to talk about privacy and it becoming sort of a bigger factor. Um, so, you know, you have Cambridge Analytica, all these types of news stories um, sort of stacking up. And, you know, I was just thinking to myself, if I project these trends out and I think about more regulations like CCPA and others around the world, and at the same time, just generally um, the consumers of the internet caring a lot more about their privacy once they know about it, um, that something big was going to come along. So it was generally that big trend that led me to think, uh, you know, it's something that I've been passionate about for a while. Maybe this is really going to be the turning point um, for, you know, privacy uh, online. So I left, I, uh, me and my co-founder, Ben, we started up the company in London. Um, at the time, it was very much a, uh, you know, it's still very, I mean, I assume a lot of people here would probably be aware. Um, there's a lot that's like changed over the last two years. The, the first, you know, the first instance, there's a lot of discussion around like, what is GDPR? A lot of people didn't understand different companies are approaching it in different, in different ways. And so we're sort of playing around with uh, several ideas, trying to think about, you know, which sort of particular part of GDPR, or like how did we want to approach privacy? And we were always confident that we wanted to do it from, um, you know, help companies do it. We felt that that was the biggest obstacle. So, you know, you could, there could be, a billion apps that help consumers sort of, uh, let's say, for an example, um, you know, submit a subject access request, but that request would always be meaningless if the company couldn't um, fulfill the request on the other side. So we felt that that was the biggest barrier to sort of the world that we envisioned. Um, and so we were playing around some ideas, you know, helping companies do these things. And at the time, it's very much a, uh, you know, a huge number of companies are talking about cookies and cookie notices. And this was, I don't really know how it ended up happening, but this was sort of the first um, real sort of, you know, clear cut product that fell out of, of GDPR um, and just privacy in general. So it was something that we were, you know, we were using on our own websites as we were sort of throwing up landing pages. Um, and, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of interest in the way that we had done our cookie notice. Uh, and so, you know, we sort of, we sort of sort of turned that into a product ourselves that other companies use the way that we were doing it, which is just easy and it was designed a little bit different. Um, and, you know, that sort of, that sort of got quite a lot of popularity amongst the uh, tech startup scene. And, and here we are today. I mean, there's so many ways that we can go from there, but I, I want to get us to your approach to building a privacy first startup. I, I will certainly get to the, to the cookies. I know we want to end uh, this series, each episode in the series with an explainer and how certain technical and privacy concepts um, what they are and how they work and and we'll get to cookies later but can you share with us you were here you you and your co-founder Ben decided to start Metomic um, you want to help other companies solve some of their biggest problems in privacy as you know necessitated by privacy laws like GDPR and CCPA what was that like trying to do that for others but also deciding that you know you need to walk the talk yourself as a startup? Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so let, you know, 
it's it's good in the sense that it helped us understand what are these com- what are what are other companies going to be faced with both now but in the future, right? So we always um, wanted to hold you know hold ourselves a high bar re- with with privacy, and you know, I think a lot of people here would understand and, and sort of agree with me when I say that GDPR and I'd, I'd actually say that um, any privacy regulation, at least the ones that I'm you know well aware of they're not so much like zero one, uh, zero one. Like it's not like you're clearly, you're clearly not GDPR compliant or you clearly are. There's obviously cases when you're clearly not GDPR compliant, but being GDPR compliant, there's still a lot up for interpretation, especially two years ago when really nothing had like, you know, no precedence had been set. So we always thought to ourselves, we should obviously, you know, obviously seek GDPR compliance, but even maybe go above and beyond that, right? Really think about um, our consumers and putting them first, which ultimately, um, GDPR and, and, and the regulations, these do do this, right? They sort of create this concept of a data subject and, you know, they sort of flip the balance of power in some ways and say, you know, the data subjects are in, um, in control of their data. Um, so we always did these types of things and um, we wanted to see what that journey was like going through it ourselves. And I'll tell you what, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy. Uh, it wasn't easy at all. So there was, you know, there's so many obstacles that you run into um, pretty quickly. Um, when you when you when you read the GDPR, when you think about these regulations, and you say we're going to sort of build our company with privacy by design from day one, um, for some of those, you know, like you know, very simple things, right? Like you immediately run into the obstacles that okay, we can't use um, analytics tools, so we can't use like Google Analytics, which is probably the most popular one without consent. Um, we can't, you know, sort of a lot of advertising, uh, online advertising, retargeting certainly. Um, even with consent, we sort of, you know, we did, we wanted to question that and think about maybe there's other ways around it. Um, and even down to like really, really sort of granular things, right? If you, t- if you look at some parts, again, I, I reference GDPR a lot because obviously, you know, we're based out of London and a lot of our customers are in Europe and a lot of our customers use us for GDPR reasons. But if you take sort of principles like data minimization, it makes you think, so to, to email our customers, do we really need to, you know, use a third party service like MailChimp? Uh, or whatever it may be. Uh, and so, you know, we went about building all these things ourselves, right? So we really held ourselves to a really high standard. Um, it's both been like a really positive thing for us. I think it's always, it's also, also been a negative thing for us um, in the sense that it, it slows you down massively. Like it, there's, there's still very clearly like a lack of infrastructure um, on the privacy side of things. And a lot of the most common tools that, you, that normally you wouldn't really question, you just go and use them as a tech startup. Uh, it, when you start questioning them, you think it actually runs into a lot of barriers to think, okay, if we can't use that, how are we going to do it? So the positives of that, though, is it does make you think about um, solutions. It does make you think about other companies are probably going to go through these things in the future, even if they're not today. Some of them are doing it today. But two years down the line, we suspect more companies will have these problems because, you know, consumers will demand a higher bar of privacy from them. Um, and, you know, we can basically start solving these problems ahead of time. Um, for ourselves so it's worked out uh, really well for us in that sense for sure but it's also been um, you know a really big challenge and I'd say that's in, in general a good way. You bring up a really good point the the world today as it was built has been built without you know privacy in mind with with privacy as an afterthought at the most right it's only very recently that we've started talking about yeah. building privacy into technology and, and tech features um, and yes, that, that's held us back and that, 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 that still holds us back today. But there's also this market opportunity that's coming up because of laws like GDPR and CCPA and because consumers have been developing their privacy sentiment towards in favor of privacy. And I love your point about um, thinking of, solu- of solutions for others that come after you because this is exactly where privacy innovation, we see privacy innovation. Um, but to me, that's, that's really exciting, which leads me to one of the things I wanted to ask you, which is what, what gets you excited in the intersection of privacy and technology? What are some of the things that are top of mind for you as, as a privacy tech CEO? Uh, honestly, too many things, too many things. So, um, that's Maybe one of the top three. <laughs> the top, okay. It's the top three. So, um, Original, like so always you know i've always been um i think so you know things we talk a lot about privacy we talk a lot about compliance and we're also i'm sure like really familiar with the concepts of 
not con even not even concepts, the way that this is often translated into transparency and control of data. So for me, when I, you know, when I, um, because I'm not a lawyer, I'm, you know, reading, reading the GDPR, understanding it deeply, right? And we do quite a lot of this across our entire team. But the way that we think about it is how do we translate this into sort of more of an understandable, more simple, like for, both for us and our customers, how do we sort of like really sort of break this down conceptually into something that's more understandable for, you know, tech startups um, and tech companies in general, right? And for, which means today, almost any company, because they've got some sort of online presence. Um, and the way that we think about that is, is generally like, how do you ask people for data when you have your, when you have their data, what do you do with it? And if they, if they want it back, um, how do you give those controls? So if you imagine like, you know, a house or a warehouse or something, it's generally like you've got a door that's the way in. Um, are you got to make sure that when people are coming through your door, you're sort of, you know, giving them the right notices, telling them the right things, making sure they're aware of what they're going into. When they're in there, you got to make sure that you treat them fairly, their data fairly, right? In the sort of, um, in the sense, not putting it in the wrong places, uh, making sure you've got the right security measures in place so that there's no leaks, et cetera, et cetera. And then if, you know, someone wants to leave your house, right? You've got to make sure there's a way for them to do that. Whereas previously you sort of signed up to a company online and they would have your email address pretty much forever. And there was no way for you to go back or like no way by law really for you to go back to them and say, hey, I don't want you to have my email address anymore. So those are the three, like the ways that we think about um, privacy really broadly. And I'm, I'm honestly excited about all three. I think definitely the first and the third. So, you know, the way in and, and the way out is really interesting. So um, in, more in terms of, you know, the way that we think about things as privacy experts in terms of consent, um, breaking down consent, being transparent. I'm excited to see a world where I actually do know when I'm giving my data to organization, where exactly it's going. And I'm not just taking a privacy policy that even if I want to read it, it's probably not going to tell me too much. And even if I do understand the privacy policy, I probably still don't believe that this is actually the case because it's probably going to end up in you know many other pies hands. And that's not even the fault of the company in a lot of cases. So I think the transparency aspect, the consent aspect, aspect of it, um, will consent as like a subset, subset of transparency, I'd say. Um, I think that's super interesting. I think it's I think it's interesting not just because it will mean the world is a better place. I think it's I think it's interesting because it's really hard to do. It's really hard from like a design perspective. Um, if you take one example, right, like cookies, which obviously we're pretty familiar with, um, for a lot of companies, especially ones that are publishers and they advertise, um, they can be sending data to hundreds of companies um, in a lot of senses. And then it becomes a design question of like how do you make that clear to an end user when they're signing up? They want to have a good a flow through to your application. They want to have a really good like frictionless user experience, but at the same time you want to tell them all these things and make sure they're aware of it. So I don't think anyone's really figured that out yet, which is um, which is really interesting. You know, we've been trying to make some moves around it. I hope we've been making progress. But I still think there's going to be loads of innovation there. Um, a little bit about what you guys are actually doing there, sure. because I I've seen some of the things you were doing in terms of you know contextual consent, and to me that's exciting. Um, so yeah, tell our audience about what some of the tools you're building and, and, and your approach to that, your version of how the world should be when it comes to, to consent in, in that space. Yeah, so I th it's again, it's like one of, the, it's one of the challenges that companies face with, um, with consent. So I, I don't believe that consent should be um, all up front, right? So it shouldn't be, and this, just, this relates more to than just cookies, right? So take the two examples. Most websites you you um, go to, they'll say, you know, um, you agree to cookies or you can't use our website. And it's like this sort of just like wall and you sort of have a binary option. You either agree and you use the website or you don't agree and you can't use the website. If you're lucky, you, 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 you don't agree and you can use the website. And then even when you're like signing up, so you're like, you know, becoming more of a customer, let's say, of that company, of that, you know, um, that product, that tool generally you're ticking a box that says you agree to the privacy policy. Um, and that can be, you know, it's a design issue. It's hard to sort of like look into the privacy policy, break that out into small things. So we've always been motivated by the idea of breaking consent out. So making it more contextual, take, picking it apart into its more individual pieces and just making it more like flow as part of the user experience. So less so the way that we see consent done today, which is it's a jarring experience. It feels like it's not actually part of the experience. It feels like it's there because it has to be. 
but what about if websites, if applications can just make it a very natural part of the flow of using that product, all the way from sign up through to using new features, through to using features that didn't exist before, making that like consent part of it is really important. So as you mentioned, one of the things, you know, we've, uh, we sort of built, um, it wasn't like a, like a huge, uh, huge feature, but it was a nice addition to, to, to the sort of cookie solution that we currently got today, which is called contextual consent, which is um, a lot of our customers were blocking visible third party content, let's say chat widgets on their website, and they were putting it into their Matomic widget. So Matomic widget would pop up and say like, do you agree to cookies? Cookies are used to you know, power chat widgets and you know, to, uh, for YouTube videos and these types of things. And then those customers might click no. So the users, the visitors of those websites might click no. And then they didn't realize, but that meant that they can't chat with the website, right? Because Intercom or Crisp or whatever chat provider they're using wouldn't pop up. Or maybe videos or like places where there used to be videos on the website would now be blank spaces. So we felt that was a real issue because I don't think the user really knew so much about that that was going to be the case. So what we did is we created a little way that makes it really easy for companies to basically keep these things in place, but they don't drop cookies until consent is given. And the way we essentially do that is um, the chat widgets, the Facebook, uh, sorry, the, the YouTube videos, they sort of load as like JPEGs or just pictures so they've actually, um, that they're, they're not really processing data in any way until someone clicks on them and they say, hey, we see that you're trying to use this YouTube video. You're trying to chat with us. Um, do, you, you, do you agree to our, to our cookie policy before doing that? And so it breaks it apart, makes it more contextual and just makes it a normal natural flow. And we've had great feedback from that. Like it's been a really, uh, a really sort of positive addition to um, you know, what's typically considered a negative user experience on the internet, which is your classic um, big wall of text that says, do you agree to cookies, yes or no? I mean, that sounds really neat to me because it's not, you know, it's not one or the other. It's not privacy or performance or usability. It's a way to be able to deliver both to the users, right? They, they can still, they still have the option to load the video or to chat with, with a website owner. Um, but they also, you're also able to get the consent to them but with that context, as opposed to just that jarring, you know, one size fits all uh, in the front end. So yeah. um, that, that, that seems like a really cool and, and neat tool to start deploying across our, our websites. Um, and yeah. so I, I liked one of the things that you mentioned earlier, you know, you said something about, I'm not a lawyer. And I wanted to go back to that because I never thought that privacy was for lawyers. It's a very, it's a very cross-functional area. And one of the things that I, that's bothered me for years is the territoriality of it. And I think, I, I'm not sure if it's, if it's intentional. I don't think it is. It might be that some of it's based off of the fact that we lawyers and engineers and policymakers and compliance folks and auditors just speak different language, but we, yeah, we sure. need to bring some of that. Um, what was, so what's, what has your experience been like in, in trying to uh, translate some of the policy high level legal requirements into code? And that really goes into one of the questions that our attendees have um, when it comes to, you know, what your approach to privacy by design is. To me, sure. you, privacy by design has a bunch of high level principles, but we, we need to translate those principles into code. Right, and so that's to me the answer is pri is privacy engineering, but that's a very simplistic response. I'd, I'd love to hear about um, how you get from the high level privacy principles to to which is where the lawyers and the policymakers dwell to translating it into requirements and to ones and zeros in, in engineering speak. For sure. Yeah. Look, it's it's a great question. So um, it's been it's been something that's developing like relatively rapidly over the last two years, which is if you do take, if you do take the as text and then you think about how that relates to, let's say some form of deep tech company, um, originally that bridge never existed, right? That translation never existed. And over the last two years, we've seen um, different players, both companies um, like ourselves, like service providers, um, other companies, individuals, engineers, academics, um, a whole range of uh, different different people and organizations have been constructing this bridge to sort of understand what is it. And 
to be honest with you, um, I wouldn't have expected it to happen any quicker. Like it's, it's a difficult thing to translate. Firstly, because of the extent of, of, of what these regulations, um, firstly, just the extent of the regulations. And secondly, the sort of like um, the, not just the, the, the width of them, but the depth of them, they really sort of touch on quite uh, deep topics. And so it's been hard in doing that translation, right, in creating that bridge. Um, but it has, been, it has been a pretty, pretty positive thing. For me, you know, if, when we first started, uh, we, and we still believe this a lot today, like privacy is just as much, um, if not more, uh, it depends on the way that you sort of define this. You know, it is, it is very much like a technical problem. There is no way that an online company, um, especially like, you know, a deep tech type company can think about the GDPR without thinking about effects on the technology. And we see this, right? We speak to a load of engineers. It's really had um, quite a material impact on their, on, on their role. Um, one of the things that I think is still missing in all of this and, and sort of the layer back from that is actually just education. So even, even if we can construct that bridge, even if we can really create meaningful solutions for uh, privacy regulations in code, there's still a huge number of questions that are being asked regarding like, when do I need to use that code or how do I use that code or does this apply to me, right? Should I be, should I be the company that needs to use this or does it not apply for me in this case? So there's something that we've been working on a lot. Um, we've been thinking about internally. And I think generally the industry, I mean, ironically, it's, you know, it's part of why we're doing this today, right? It's the education piece, right? I think that layer um, that might sit just before even sort of the technical imp implementations of this, let's say, is really something that's been missing. And so that bridge needs to exist as well. Companies need to understand um, what these things mean, how they apply to them, and ways that they should go about it. Um, so that, that's that been something that we've been working on, and I, and I do think it's a super important thing. The technical thing, um, as I said, that bridge has been building that, like, that layer of translation. Uh, it seems to be moving in a positive direction, and I'm actually incredibly excited about what it's going to look like in the next five years. That's, that's certainly, you, you touch upon one of the important things that we still need to do as an industry, and that's education. Um, I, I do have to say that we've gone quite a long way from where we were five years ago, where Definitely. the conversations internally are uh, along the lines of, you know, privacy is dead. Like, why do we need to, to buy this tool or fund this privacy program to, um, especially because of GDPR to CCPA, we've, we've gone to, we've jumped to board level and, and, and uh, C-level discussions of what are we doing in terms of privacy? But I think you're right in terms of not a lot of folks still understand when, when privacy applies, whether it applies, uh, the context and, and what sh they should be doing. And that's certainly one of the things that we wanna do in terms of uh, one of our goals for this series. Um, and, and so I, I think that leads us to one of the things that, that I, I asked you about earlier, which is, um, what do you think is one of the biggest, if not maybe top three biggest uh, challenges that you see in this area yeah. when it comes to privacy? So we, um, we talked about education, certainly, but um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to speak for you, but if you have other thoughts about what are, what are the other ways that we can, we can help um, and what are the other problems that you see that we can keep solving for, for our customers and for consumers? It's a really, yeah, so this is, um, I mean, obviously this is top of mind for us every day, right? Like what are the challenges faced by companies? Um, how do we potentially solve them? Or even how do we help these, how, how do we help our customers solve them? Even if we're not the ones with the solution. Um, as I mentioned, I won't go into again, the education piece is certainly a big part. We are certainly making a lot of progress there and I, and I see that continuing on. Um, there's, there's a, there is a ton of other things. What comes to mind when I think about these challenges, one of them that we frequently run into um, for any company is something that you mentioned before, which is the internet was not built to for privacy. It wasn't um, it wasn't like a real uh, simple layer that we just needed to like apply on top of the previous software that we built, um, and it was like you know just magically solve everything. It's a really sort of deep rooted problem that's really at the heart of not just um, you know SaaS platforms and sort of products, but actually the internet as a whole. So that has been um, you know, a really uh, that is like a really big problem and, and, and to sort of talk about it in terms of more of a real life example, which is we speak to a load of companies that they want to be compliant. Um, and they, 
they want to do the right thing. They want to spend money on it. They want to take the time. They want to treat their users' data fairly. And they have extremely good intentions. And then that leading to the education part, right? The first thing they need to figure out is, okay, what does that, what does that mean we have to do, right? If we want to be compliant, if we want to give users transparency and control of data, let's write down the things that we need to do. Um, and whether that be someone else helping them or they you know, figure those things out themselves, one of the next barriers that a lot of companies I see running into is their business model um, doesn't work the same way if they you know, really meet these, compli um, these compliance obligations as they're sort of written down. Um, an example might be you know, marketing or advertising. A lot of companies rely so heavily on analytics even. Even if you don't do a lot of online advertising, they make it. They 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 drive um, a huge amount of value from being able to see where their users are coming from, what messaging is working on the website, all these types of things. And then you've got really like you know clear cut examples here in um, here in Europe regarding how these things fit in with with GDPR and consent. And you know that you can't. Then you realize that you can't load a lot of these things, um, such as you know the Facebook Pixel or Google Analytics without consent. Um, and then you get to that stage and like okay, right, we really want to, you know, be, be privacy first, we want to be compliant, but actually, if we meet these obligations, we might lose half of our marketing department, right, because we drive a lot of our, you know, new leads um, via these, like, tools. So that has, been a, that has been a huge barrier for a lot of companies. Um, I actually think it's a huge barrier for the industry as a whole, which is, I think there's a lot of companies out there, but I know there's a lot of companies out there that want to sort of, you know, brand themselves as privacy first, very, genuinely so they want to do it they want to write it down they want to put work into it they want to put time into it and they want to show their users that they care about it and i think these smaller things you could you could define this bigger but these like small little barriers that actually turn out to be really big barriers are the things that are preventing them from saying we're privacy first and i think the more companies that come out and say this you know encourage more companies to do the same thing and so there's a lot of companies that are just on the edge they really want to do the right thing but yet there's just like these tiny things that are just holding them back and so it's sort of like holding back the industry as a whole. This is the way that I think about it. Um, so I would love to see these things solved um, because a lot of these uh, functionalities, let's say, I think can be done in a compliant way. I don't think there's, it's, it's either you're compliant and you don't do them or you do them and you're not compliant. I think there's solutions that fit in the middle of those things. Um, we're not building uh, a lot of them. We're not building uh, all of them, but I hope that we see a lot of innovation in regards to how we're doing this. And we're seeing this today, right? You've got different analytics tools, different ways to do contextual um, marketing and stuff like that. So uh, I'm hoping again, over the next couple of years, that we're going to see some progress there and it will allow more companies to break through, sort of brand themselves as privacy first, very authentically. And that will lead other companies to look at them and say, well, we want to do the same thing as them. And then they'll put effort into it as well. So I think, if those barriers can come down, we'll see a lot of progress quite quickly. I, I want to go back to what you said about, you know, the internet is not built for privacy. And, and this is so true. We've come to realize that we have decades worth of privacy technical debt that we need to address, right? And, and you said you guys are, are working on some of the solutions, but there's so much opportunity and there's so many uh, other areas that other startups, at least we do see other startups address um, based on the world as it is today, but we also see startups coming up with an alternative to how the world is today. And I think you probably have seen, you know, Sir Tim Berners-Lee's erupt in, in his startup and how, you know, he doesn't like how the, the internet's been built. And so they're trying sure. to address it differently. They want to build a different internet where uh, data where consumers have more control over who gets their data. Um, and, and to me, it's interesting. I, I don't know that we could just, uh, I'm hopeful, but I don't know that we could just upend the, the world as it is today. And so I think there's room for both, right? There's, there, there are, there's room for solutions to address the privacy technical debt that we've created from decades worth of building tools without privacy in mind. Um, but I'm also hopeful that there could be an alternative to how to how the internet has been built so far. Um, so I guess now that we're talking innovation in the privacy space, what privacy technology or feature do you wish existed? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I want to just like highlight that point. Um, 
I just because I think it's so important. I, you, you see these very like fundamental innovations going on um, in terms of, you know, people that are trying to rebuild like very fundamental features of the internet, um, of, you know, browsers, all these types of things. And I think that shows the extent of the problem, right? When a problem is that difficult, it's that deep, it requires innovation at like a very much like a ground level. Um, say for example, you know, just to use like a random example of, you know, Salesforce and sort of, um, you know, like uh, sort of early stage, like SaaS types companies, um, they didn't need to rebuild the internet to achieve that they wanted to do. And they had like really clear cut problems, but they were like, you know, easy to do within the internet that is today. When you have innovation that's like redesigning browsers, that's even re, re, you know, re-architecting parts of the internet, let's say, um, it just shows the sort of the depth of this problem. And this is why I think that privacy, um, you know, it won't always just look like a Salesforce type tool, right? It won't always just be dashboards and sort of graphs um, and, you know, manually inputting data. Um, I think, you know, this is where we're at today and this, well, this is sort of where we've been at and this is where we will continue to be for a while. Um, but I think we're going to see like a lot of innovations going on at very like fundamental layers, which is super exciting, right? And as I said, we're working on some of them. It's good for us if others are working on them too. Um, and so I think it's going to be a really interesting couple of years. Um, I'm going to answer your question, which privacy, I think you asked like which privacy features technology do I wish existed? Um, again, I don't want to hold everyone here for too long. So the answer is too many. Um, but I'll keep it, I'll keep it confined to like a couple. And maybe I'll think about what do I wish as a user of the internet? What do I um, wish is like, you know, a company that's, you know, operating in the space. So um, as a user of the internet, something that I talked about before, and I'll bring it up again, is just transparency. It sounds like, it sounds really simple, but one of my biggest frustrations is, um, and I don't blame necessarily companies in a lot of senses. I think this is just a, you know, a difficult problem to be solving. You're not is, talking about privacy policies. Privacy policies. Privacy policies and are you're interesting. Not, you're not talking just to be clear, just to be clear, you're not talking about privacy policies. <laughs> privacy <laughs> when it comes to transparency. <laughs> I try to be fair, like I think privacy policies is part of it. Um, okay. I think that a privacy policy itself can like just be like we talked about before, contextual consent. I think it can be broken down and it can be more you know in inside in like broken down and put inside the flow of things. So if I'm signing up to you know, an app and all I'm going to do is use the basic features. Does that mean I need to read the full privacy policy that talks about a whole load of other features that I don't ever think I'll need? Um, probably not. So I think the, just the, the transparency in terms of like how it's like customized to me, it's what I'm getting, it's honest. Um, and it is what it is. I think that'd be a huge progress. Like I would love to see a world, um, even if my data is being used in places that I don't want it to be used, if I knew about that, I, I would consider that progress. I think the opaqueness is something that certainly needs to be cleared up. Um, and so as a user, that's something that I certainly think about. Um, as a, well, maybe, maybe even aside from uh, like a technical feature, um, I would love to see a level of um, privacy grading. Uh, I would love to see, not necessarily to point fingers at certain, at certain, at certain companies, but there's, again, it comes down to transparency, which is like, if I'm using two different um, SaaS tools, I'm using two different apps on my phone, whatever it may be, I wish that I could have a very structured way of sort of looking at the way that they use my data. Of course, I can do that by deeply analyzing each privacy policy. I don't think that would get anywhere doing that, but some sort of like consistent way to look at the way these companies are going to deal with my data. And I don't necessarily just mean that's, you know, a grade from A to D or whatever. Um, but sort of just like a real summary of, of how they can use my, how they can use my data. Um, is it sort of, you know, safe, uh, how many third parties is it going to get in the hands of and some sort of grading, right. On a very simplistic level, um, I think would, you know, benefit a lot. It would allow companies to differentiate. And again, it might sort of increase this, um, level of competition, uh, in terms of privacy that would sort of accelerate the space forward. The reality, the reality is today is that we don't know. Um, for a lot of us, we, you know, it's, it's hard to tell which companies are thinking about privacy first um, and they're spending hours a day and, you know, tons of money investing in it versus those that aren't. Um, and I wish that there was a way to really think about the companies that think about privacy, you know, in the right way it doesn't necessarily mean that they're perfectly compliant. It just means they're thinking about things in the right way versus ones that 
you know, they don't spend any time on tool and they don't have any intention to spend time on it in the next year or so. Um, so I'd love to see something like that, which maybe not be a technical feature, but certainly some form of feature of the, of the broader space that would be interesting to me. I mean, that's super interesting to me. I, I think I came about, and I don't, I don't remember who it was or what their name was, but there was certainly the um, group or startup that was talking about Yelp-like privacy reviews. Um, yeah. The challenge there is that a lot of the data practices happen behind closed doors. Sure. And so it's hard to assess what a company is doing with your data because a lot of that is not necessarily transparent to the public, right? Um, and and yeah. there's a, um, I mean, GDPR has Article 30, which requires uh, you know, folks to, uh, companies to um, be able to, 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 to track what they're doing with data and then respond to, um, to, to document that and provide that to regulators and then to respond to data subject access requests when asked about, about their data practices. But it's still, there's still that step of making that request from either the consumer side or the regulatory or the regulator side. Um, but I'm, I'm with you there. It'd be interesting if we started uh, having you know, more information sharing about my experience with this company and what they did uh, with my data, um, but but we do have that we do have some challenges there in terms of who knows what they're doing behind closed doors. Uh, yeah. So, I I think we're kind of getting there with time. But before we we end, I I do want us to go over a couple um, different things. And 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 I mentioned earlier that we want to end each episode of the series with some sort of explainer and. I know you and I talked about, you know, maybe for this for this episode, if you'd be up to give us like a primer and explainer on cookies, how it works today as the world uh, is today, and um, you know where you want it to go. Yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, this is a question. This is a question I got asked a lot. Uh, so. Um, cookies, they're, you know, they're, they're a complex, they're a complex beast, which is, um, you know, the webs websites, the internet in general is actually kind of, um, kind of a messy place, um, technically. Uh, cookies are, you know, the super interesting development. I think them in themselves aren't interesting. I think what they speak for um, generally is, is, is more interesting. Um, you know, even if the problem of cookies get cleared up, it doesn't mean that this problem I'm going to talk about is fully cleared up. Cookies are just like a very small vehicle um, of achieving certain things, but you know, there's many other vehicles that are just ready to go. Um, so cookies themselves are, you know, a lot of people talk about them. Um, they might sort of just like drop out over time and, you know, companies will move on to like other methods of doing the same thing. I mean, in general- What are the reasons okay. that companies have cookies for, for our again. audience? For our audience, can you talk to us about the different reasons why for sure. Well, companies drop cookies and what their purpose is as cookies, because there are different purposes and some of them might be more legitimate than others. Yeah, I mean, so I'll even go a level deeper than that. I mean, like explaining something that I, um, you know, that I'm really interested in, maybe not in a good way, uh, but I love sort of sharing with people because I don't think a lot of people understand. You've got like very basic usage of things. So you've got, um, I'm sure everyone's heard of, you know, essential versus like non-essential and cookies can be really useful, right? So I take like a really easy example you're shopping around on Amazon or any like, you know, online grocery store and you're flicking between pages um, and it turns out that your basket remains the same. So you put something in your basket, you go to another page, maybe even turn off your browser, you come back again and your, your basket still has one thing in it. Um, these things are, um, you know, these things, these things are useful. It's just the same as you, you know, you load up your favorite, uh, you know, you, I don't know, Facebook's your favorite, but you load up something and you're logged in, right? Without having to log in again, uh, this can often be down to cookies. So in some ways they're useful. I think ways in which they um, have been, uh, they're useful, but there's sort of like a darker side of them. Uh, an example for this I can give you is, is the Facebook pixel. So um, not to like discredit anyone in, in like this using the Facebook pixel, but I think there's a lot of like, there's a lot of murkiness behind it. So the Facebook pixel is like a really, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively simple thing, right? So the promise to companies, and, and this is a benefit, which is if you want to advertise to people that come to your website on Facebook, you have to use the Facebook pixel. And that makes sense. Uh, it's, you know, I don't think it's compliant, but 
without without getting correct consents in place, of course. But if you want, if you've got some sort of e-commerce store um, and you've also got a Facebook account and you want people that are putting stuff in their e-commerce baskets and then dropping out at the last minute, you want to advertise them later and say, hey, do you know, you, I thought you wanted this bike, then you might use something like the Facebook pixel. Now that sort of makes sense from a company's perspective, like the e-commerce store, um, you know, you can claim it's beneficial to them because they get to sort of, you know, these customers may have dropped out because they had something to run off to, right? And they did want to buy the bike. Um, but there is a dark, there is a much darker side to this, which is um, basically the analogy that I think of, which is if I'm a browser of the internet and I land on that e-commerce store's website, um, if that if that if that e-commerce store is using something like the Facebook Pixel, what's essentially happening there is is Facebook sort of tagging me with the sticky with the sticky note, right? So it's putting something on my back, not literally, of course, but it's putting something on my back that's basically saying like you know user ID, whatever my user ID is, visited this e-commerce store. And it goes a bit deeper than that. It doesn't just say I visited the e-commerce store. It says I was looking at this green, you know, this green bike. Um, and that's, that's, that's great. So then I go onto my next website because I'm just browsing for the day and maybe I go onto, you know, a media site or whatever it may be. And that media site is also using the Facebook pixel. Um, and so I land on that media site and it, and Facebook again sort of tags me or something which says user ID. And this is a different user ID this time. I was looking about news uh, about privacy, let's say. Um, and this is fine right now because I've got these different, well, it's not, it's not fine, but I've got these different sticky notes on my back that say, you know, it's got different user IDs in it and it's got different purposes. Um, at this point, Facebook or any, you know, big, big company at this stage doesn't know who I am, uh, but it's just like creating these tags for me. What then happens is uh, later on at the end of the day, I log into Facebook um, and all of these basically sticky notes sort of aggregate into one and Facebook's able to say, right, user ID one, two, three is the same as user ID two, three, four, which means that this person who's got an account with us, so they know that my name is Rich Vibert, that, you know, they know what my job is, they know who my relationships are with. They say, turns out that earlier today he was visiting an e-commerce store and looking at green bikes. And at the same time, uh, he was browsing, uh, you know, media sites and news articles about privacy. So that is like, just the browsing behavior sort of all aggregated up into one and it's how they paint such a, like an accurate picture of things. So not only does it help the e-commerce store advertise the green bike to me, it allows a lot of other companies to sort of perform to, to advertise to people that like green bikes at the same time they're interested in privacy. So I'm a brand new company, a startup and I say, my customer is people that like green bikes, they're interested in privacy. Facebook's got that power to say, we know exactly those types of people. And so they can form this big, this big graph of the way that, you know, the way this sort of world is connected. Um, and why I think that, you know, cookies, a lot of people sort of dismiss them as, well, it's just a cookie notice, right? We'll, we'll concentrate on the bigger parts of GDPR, like consent management or like rights management um, or anything like that. I actually find that a bigger impact on the world, a, a massive impact on the world right now is being caused just due to um, these small cookies. Um, so they may seem small and they may sort of be dismissed as conversations, but actually the impacts they're having on the world in terms of what we buy, who we speak to, who we vote for, um, what we believe in even uh, can actually be attributed to cookies, um, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. I mean, thank you for that. And you're absolutely right. You know, there are essential or important uses to cookies, but then there's the darker side that raises privacy issues. And I think it's all about the tracking, right? So beyond the, the performance type cookies and the things that are pretty useful for us to use a certain website, we do have other types of cookies that track us all over the internet. And there are ramifications, like you said, in terms of how we how we vote, what we do, uh, the research that's being done and us as users. And so thank you for that. I, I, I do appreciate you helping us educate um, the world on, on things like this. Um, and so I want to give you a chance and maybe the audience, I know that we had a couple of questions that came in and, and we answered, but if they want to, please feel free to, to ask us a couple more. Um, but if not, I, I do want to give you a chance, uh, Rich, to kind of close up with where you see this field, the privacy, the privacy and technology field going and where you want it to go and what your hope is, whether you're hopeful at all or, or in despair when it comes to the future of, of privacy and technology. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm 100% I'm hopeful. Um, 
So there's like one thing that I know and there's one thing that I don't know. Um, or at least like I'm very confident and I'm not confident in. The one thing that I'm really confident in is that privacy is going to have um, a big impact on the internet. And we use the word big here. If you compare that to today, I think relatively privacy has had a small impact on the internet in terms of what it, what it might, might be in the, in, in the, in the total future. Um, I think it's going to completely redesign a lot of the way that we use um, you know, services, the way that companies build their technology. So many things that I you can't even predict. That's what I'm excited about, right? I think we will look back and we sort of have these innovations of like, you know, imagine an app when we can, um, you know, transfer data from one service to another, one app from another. I hope and I'm confident that we'll look back and think that was even that, even that was an ignorant um, sort of prediction. That was only a small part of where it could really go. And so I think we'll see huge developments that no one could predict. And that, that, that's super exciting to be powering that and to think, um, you know, we just want to help companies solve these problems because if they can solve them, we get to see a world that no one can see today. The thing that I don't know is how long it's going to take. So um, I think, you know, we would have we, sort of been, you know, a couple of years since GDPR. There's certainly been progress. Some people could argue there could have been more progress. And so I think we're going to see a combination of um, uh, generally just um, like good progress on a day to day, like iterative progress that happens, um, you know, on a week on week basis. And at the same time, I think we'll have sort of, um, doses of big paradigm shifts in the way that we do things, right? And that can be attributed to one company, could be attributed to like groups of people, um, it could be attributed to like massive companies like Facebook, right? I think these companies are actually making more progress in privacy than a lot of others because they know that they need to. Um, so I think we're gonna see general progress and I think every now and again, we're gonna wake up and, and, and think, where's that come from? This is crazy, like something's different. Um, and so I don't know how long it's gonna take, but I'm, I'm confident it's gonna happen. I love it. I think we need hope in order to change the way the world is right now in terms of, of internet and sure. privacy. Um, so, so I like that, that that's your response. I, I am hopeful as well. And I, I know some of my colleagues in privacy aren't as hopeful when it comes to that because they've seen, they've been in it for 20 years. Um, right. I, I have seen quite a lot of progress and I think we're in a really interesting time in terms of not just the regulators, but also the consumers and the business customers all, uh, kind of developing a more mature stance when it comes to privacy and, and, and asking for more privacy. And so uh, I want to thank you for, I know you're busy as a startup founder. So thank you for joining us today and helping us educate the public when it comes to and, uh, privacy and, and, and cookies and, and other very important challenges that we're facing today. And I also want to thank the attendees for, for, for joining us live. We'll make this available. Um, Publicly, I, I, I'm not. I'll have to check with our marketing team, but I, I'm I'm told by YouTube and maybe even through uh, pod, podcast platforms. So thank you, Rich, and thank you, everyone. Um, I look forward to the next episode. Bye. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, everyone. You can always reach me at Richard at Atomic.io uh, or LinkedIn or Twitter. I would love to um, answer any questions that you've got or just have a chat about privacy in general. But thanks, Lords, for Absolutely. hosting today. That's great. Yep, let's take this, you know, online. And so reach out to Rich or me and we're happy to take your questions next time. Thanks, bye. Awesome, sit down guys.